Hi guys, welcome to episode 22 of Tiger Heart Chats. We are still on a health and well-being kick at the moment. We've been having so much positive responses from the last few speakers and I've got an incredible person ready for you to join and to speak and to get your juices flowing, to get your minds engaged with what we're talking about. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful, wonderful nutritionist, fitness instructor and founder of Life is good nutrition Corolla Becker thank you so much Dan. This, is, this is amazing thank you so much for having me um, I'll, I'll take this lovely introduction and pin it over my bed for all the bad days <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> no worries this is going to be a positive chat basically we've been focusing on mental health and well-being over the last few months now we're getting lots of responses people want to meet more people like yourselves and get more mm-hmm. insight into the world of nutrition and well-being there's going to be some people who are listening to this podcast who don't know you it'd be great if you could just tell us about yourself just a brief kind of introduction as to who Corolla Becker is absolutely um, more than happy to um, yes so as you as you said um, I'm a nutritionist a fitness instructor and you guessed it for me it's all about health and well-being I advise privately I work with individuals um, so they can shape well let's just say rewarding food and lifestyle routines that will really last a lifetime um, nothing worse than any food extremism any sort of diet or i'm doing this for a few weeks and then going back to normal um, because it's about well-being and readiness for every challenge your life throws at you basically and the way you eat and the way you live has a massive impact on that awesome how long have you been working within that space for um, I have I have founded Life is Good Nutrition uh, just just six years ago. Wow! Um, and it's it it was um, my my I mean I'm I'm 52. Uh, you you know how it is. We're all carrying our our own story with us. And um, I think in in my case it was it was my personal story which led me to um, finding a way into nutrition and making these changes and, and realizing for myself, wow, um, I can help myself. Maybe I can help other people. Where are you from originally? Um, I am German. Uh, I moved to the UK um, in 2008, 12 years ago. Wow. And um, never looked back. So burned my bridges in Germany. Um, I have a handful of friends and family left, but um, I don't want to go back. I'm, I'm very much at home in the UK. Whereabouts <laughs> in the UK are you based now? Um, I, I live and work in Exeter and in London. So I'm, oh, okay. I live in beautiful Devon in the, in the middle of nowhere. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I split my time between Exeter and London. Well, lockdown permitting, but um, uh, most of the time um, when I work with companies, I, I often go to London. Uh, with individuals, I, I basically work with people all over the world. So um, later when, when we're talking about how I'm working, um, I'm more than happy to go into that. A no, bit. absolutely. So give us some context as to what personal nutrition coaching is. Yes, absolutely. So um, I think we, it, it's very clear once you think about it that, our, that we are all different and we have different needs and different preferences. I mean, if you, um, I, th- I think you are married. Um, I have heard in one of your podcasts before. So you, you yes. know exactly that your wife has completely different needs than you have. Yeah. Um, you, you, I, it doesn't even, we, we don't even have to go there between men and women. I mean, if you're, if your mate is, um, I don't know, playing football and you're a runner, that means you're, you're eating different things, you need different things. But it's not, we don't have to even go that far. Um, it's about, I don't know. Some people don't like fish. And then it's me standing here. Well, you need to have certain B vitamins and omega-3 in your diet. but And it's my job to find this omega-3 and the B vitamin somewhere else. Because if you don't like fish, who am I standing here and saying, well, you have to eat fish twice a week. And that's that's the background of my work. I I personalize my work around the individual. I make sure that you get everything in your diet which suits your lifestyle, suits your preferences, 
and your taste at the end of the day. How did you get into this space? I mean, you've been running the business for six years. The stuff that I noticed online about you, it's, you know, you're, you're, you've got a lot of gravitas. You know a lot about human anatomy. And I love your spin on the fact that everyone's experience with nutrition is different. How did you get into that space and how did you define that route? Yeah, um, it, it took a long time. So obviously, if you, if you count backwards, I'm 52 now. So it took me until I was in my 40s, until I finally realized, okay, fine, this is what I want to do until the end of my life. Wow. Um, <laughs> or the end of my career, I should say. Maybe not until the end of my life. <laughs> um, it, and I think if, if I think back, it, it all started um, with a health issue. And I mean, we, we have all read those stories where the, where the really successful life coaches and nutritionists and, uh, really went through personal hardship. And um, it, it was to a certain extent the, the same in, 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 in my life. Um, right. I have developed a rare form of arthritis. Um, and because it's a rare form, nobody found it. And um, what... What sort of came to mind at one point is that even though there is a perfectly reasonable medical explanation for my arthritis, I can't help but finding it at least interesting that I experienced the very first symptoms exactly six months to the day after my father had passed away very suddenly. I'm sorry. Um, and that was, that was almost, this year it's, it's 20 years ago. So I'm, 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 I'm more than happy to, to share the story because many people ask me about it. So my, my dad was fairly young. He was 67 at the time, just retired, full of beans and perfectly healthy. And he went to hospital for a routine procedure. Um, and basically it went wrong. He, he fell into a coma. Um, my parents were at that time, um, living about 100 miles away from me, um, my mom called me and said, okay, fine, we, we need to do something. Um, uh, something is not quite right here. And um, I, I never had a chance to say goodbye to my dad. Within a week, my dad was just gone. Oh, um, gosh. And it was, it was a massive shock, literally, because if you're, if you're just saying, well, I'm, I'll just go quickly to the hospital, get this done, and then I come back home, and then it's Christmas, um, and then it was Christmas, and my dad wasn't here, so um, it it was it was simply a massive shock, and I just went into yeah into um, what's it called? Um, come on, autopilot. That was what I wanted to say. Yeah, I I literally started to run around, work like crazy, look after my mum, and I just simply functioned. Um, got somehow on with life, and then six months to the day on the 25th of June 2001, the, the pain and the swelling started in my wrists and in my hands. I know this because my birthday is the 27th of June, and I, I was just about to organize my Christmas party and I think, why can I not carry a tray with, with some baked stuff on it? Because I'm, my hands were so, were so painful. Mm. Um, and that because nobody was able to help me, um, none of the doctors, um, had the idea to ask the right question and I had no idea what was wrong with me either. Um, and, and I'm going, or I went through what, lots of people are going through is just this feeling of helplessness, not not knowing what was wrong with me. Right. Um, and because I was always a comfort eater, I started eating uh, <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> um, and sadly, on, on my list what was always sugar and processed carbohydrates. I have a massively sweet tooth, and this will never change. I still have a sweet tooth, even though I should know better. <laughs> but I know in the meantime how to to get away from it. And in back twenty years ago, within six months, I gained over three stone, and I was in pain most of the time. Whoa! And I thought, okay, fine, this this I can't continue like that. I was thirty three and hit rock bottom. And it was, funnily enough, it was the way arthritis manifests itself that helped me in the end. Um, 
I don't know if you know, but arthritis always shows in flare-ups. Sometimes you feel better, sometimes you feel worse for no apparent reason. Right. And back then, I heard for the very first time about food intolerances. And I thought, maybe I'm eating something which my body just doesn't like. Because sometimes I felt really fine. The other day, I couldn't get out of bed because I was feeling completely exhausted. Mm. So I simply started playing around with foods, randomly cutting out stuff and reintroducing it without having any idea about nutrition. And then there was literally within, within a year, there was light at the end of the tunnel by, because by pure coincidence, I found the foods that helped me managing my condition. I can, I, I, I can't claim that I am any sort of expert in terms of arthritis because arthritis is, is incurable. You can't do anything about it. Right. Um, but I know my arthritis and I know my body. So I found the aspects that helped me. I found a few foods which had an impact on my arthritis. But I found aspects like sleep, meditation, and gentle exercises, and especially the especially the gentle exercises were such such a nightmare because I was always an active person, and I, I still am, and I I hate everything slow. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, if you have, if you would have told me 20 years ago, uh, what about yoga and Pilates? I said, go away. I, I play squash and I'm boxing and I'm, I'm a snowboarder. <laughs> and, but it, it was those things that really helped my mobility. Um, and then at the same time, I finally started grieving about my dad. How long after your father passed away that you started to grieve? Um, Probably about two, three years. I can't quite tell you the date, but it, um, it must have been, I, I would say it was probably about that time, yeah. Okay. And I was, I was finally diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis only a few years ago in the UK. So if, if ever anybody says anything against the NHS, I said, well, no, all the doctors in Germany weren't able to diagnose psoriatic arthritis, but the uh, um, this is how it is. What is psoriatic arthritis? Um, you may have heard of the skin condition, psoriasis. Yep. It's those patches at your elbows, sometimes um, on your head. Yep. Um, and as an, as an onset, after you have the skin condition, you may or may not develop psoriatic arthritis. It's, it's, it's a, um, I don't know what it's called in English. If you have one thing first and the other one afterwards. A knock-on effect. A knock-on effect. Yeah, very yeah. good word. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in in very rare cases, you don't have the skin condition, but you have immediately the arthritis, because arthritis patients are normally a lot older um, than I was, because I was in my thirties. You, you get arthritis normally when you're sixties or seventies. Yeah. Um, and I never had the skin condition. And it was obviously that um, all the doctors were looking at me and she said, okay, fine, she's fine. I don't need to ask the question. But it was then um, the doctor in, in, um, at the NHS who said, do you have arthritis? And I said, uh, sorry, do you have psoriasis? And I said, no. So what about your parents? And I said, oh, yeah, both my parents have the skin condition. He said, aha, and here we go. You have psoriatic arthritis because wow. psoriasis is hereditary. And um, nobody had the idea to ask me that before. <laughs> and what was that feeling like? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to, to put it in words. But I mean, that there were two stages. The first stage, when I finally found the things that helped me, I found the foods, I found the exercises, I found meditation. That was the first milestone. But then obviously... Coming back out of the hospital and he said, okay, fine, here's your medication and now we're on a good way. And then, I, I don't know, six weeks later, I was able to move my joints again. And since then, I'm perfectly fine because wow. I'm on medication. And I thought, this is just unreal. I didn't even know how bad I was feeling because it, it became such so normal. Yeah. 
And so how long has it been since that revelation? Uh, that was pretty much the moment when I started to do, um, to decide, okay, fine, I, I need to go learn more about nutrition and I need to have a personal trainer license because I'd like to combine the both. And that was um, seven years, eight years ago now. Wow. One thing I would say, Corolla, for those of you listening, you look amazing. For 50 oh, years so of much. age, you look absolutely amazing. And all of that you've just put on the table, this story, I didn't even know that. So just to kind of hear how you've come through that and now you're on top of everything is so inspiring, so invigorating. Thank you. That is, that's really kind of you to say. So let's talk about that qualification because you came to the realization that you wanted to combine these types of notions and to get qualified. So how did you get qualified? Yeah, I I started um, with a level two in fitness instruction. Um, and I was hoping at that point that I learned enough about nutrition while doing that because I was I was keen to to get into into the fitness instruction and I wanted to do a level three personal trainer. Yeah. But I found out that the 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 amount of nutritional advice you learn as a personal trainer is really small. And I okay. I have to be a little bit careful what I'm saying because obviously there's lots of fantastic personal trainers out there. But if they are giving you nutrition advice they they most likely have an additional qualification because in the curriculum for a personal trainer there's not a lot about nutrition sadly which is a shame because it always plays together right um so i ended up um uh, getting the qualification as a fitness instructor and then found um the course in London, actually, um, for nutritional therapy and sports as a sports nutrition advisor. Right. And I qualified as both because I, as a, as a massive fan of exercise, I always wanted to ensure that I have everything touched on. I have, I, I can combine everything because if you're, if you're telling me that you're going to the gym and you can eat whatever you like, uh, that is true until you're 25 years old and afterwards it's no longer true i'm sorry it, it's not happening you have to you have to eat well and you have to train right mm. and at the same time if somebody says to me i'd like to conquer the fact that i'm constantly tired and exhausted and i'm stressed it cannot be done only with nutrition there need to be a certain amount of activity and exercise involved as well. And I'm, and I'm very glad that I will be able, well, I am able to provide them. So just with regards to those courses that you did, you said you did them in London. Yes. What institutions were they? The Health Science Academy, um, where I did both courses. How long did those courses take? Um, oh, I can't quite remember. Something about two and a half years. Okay. Yeah. Were you commuting from Exeter into London? No, I was I was able to do most of it online. I love it. Including including my exams at the end. Uh because that, that was that was really, really helpful at that point because I knew I wanted to get this done properly. I I c I can't stand here and say, Okay, fine, I'll help you with nutrition and I Google my stuff because yeah. um no there's sadly because the the field of nutrition is not regulated um everybody can call themselves a nutritionist sadly um which means you find a lot of people who are trying to sell you some products or some supplements or whatever they try to sell you or a, a certain diet where they say well yeah do this and do that and this worked for me so it has to work for you if that, if somebody tells you that run for the hills <laughs> because what worked for them is not very likely that it works for you. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of people that don't realize that is even though we're all humans and in on some level with, you know, we're the same, all of us come from a very different pool of genes. Absolutely. 
as you say, what works for someone doesn't work for everyone. My next question is, how do you break that down with a client? So you meet someone who sees value in what you do, has commissioned you to support them so that they can overcome whatever it is that they're trying to overcome through good nutrition. How do you break that down with a person and help them to achieve what it is that they want to achieve? Um, I think that the most important thing is that during the first consultation, I hardly speak. I let them talk. I need to find out what they would like to achieve. Right. And I listen a little bit to how determined they are. Because one of, one of the things I always tell people from the start, um, I can't sell this to anybody because it's not me doing the work. I'm, mm. I'm not the one who is making the changes, who um, says no when it comes to, um, I don't know, alcohol, for example, um, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it's not me who is determined to do that because I know how I feel since I make those changes to my life. And I know how my clients feel once they make those changes. But if the person in front of me doesn't want to make those changes and they're then deciding to walk around and tell their people, their contacts, oh, it, the program doesn't work. That does more harm to me than if I send them away and say, I'm sorry, I can't work with you. So okay. I really need to find out what do they like to achieve? How used are they to the fact that they're not well? Um, especially when we're when we're talking about performance, I work with a lot of people in higher positions, uh, CEOs, managers, leaders, and because they are so busy, they are almost used to the fact that they are stressed and tired, and they don't sleep well, and they don't eat well, and they do not perform to their best. So it's it's me at the in the beginning finding out what they would like to achieve, find out how determined they are, and then get them to that point where they don't need me anymore. Um, I, my accountant always says this is the major flaw in my business plan. <laughs> once, <laughs> once I'm um, I'm finished with someone, that, that, that doesn't sound right. Sorry, I apologize for my English. <laughs> once, <laughs> once the program is finished, <laughs> um, I don't want to see my client anymore because they they – at that point, they have developed habits. They have routines in place where it happens automatically. There's there's no more, oh, I really should, or hmm, do I have this chocolate biscuit or do I not? Um, and it's not about not ever having a chocolate biscuit anymore. This is, this is not the point. It's about making the right decisions 80% of the time. It's the 80-20 rule just on its head, if you like. And we're all human. Oh, God, yeah. You do have, I don't want to say a bad day, but a day where you're not at your optimum performance. Absolutely. It's okay to have those days. Yeah, absolutely. And there will always be Christmases and birthday parties and weddings and whatever it is. And you, you cannot imagine any of those events without amazing foods. Yeah. And maybe even a drink or two. It's, yeah. it's just the question, do I need to have this, this every, every week or every day? Exactly. Um, it's about making the right decisions most of the time. So I just want to focus on something. You talked about how what you want to give your client is an opportunity for them to engage with you for enough time for them to understand where to go. So you're giving them guidance, but it's kind of like giving them a torch. And yeah. you touched on the ethics of that. Just like you, I'm not looking for a client that's a cash cow. I'm not looking to constantly make money from that client. What I love to do is give them good value, good service, and for them to appreciate what I've given them so that they can move on in the comfort of knowing that I've given them the best that I can. Exactly. Why for you is that important? Honestly, especially when we're looking at magazines and newspapers um, in about four weeks in January, when they're all blasting out that you have to go on a low-carb diet. And when we're looking at the, the big companies who, especially with 
weight loss, making a lot of money. Mm. Um, and I always say, these big companies, they are only successful when you are not successful, because that's the reason why you continue to come back to them and to make um, the, oh, this time it's forever. And you do that with, I don't know, two or three times a year and it never works. Um, and it's, it's just not the way I want to, to operate. It's not the way I wanted to, to be associated. It's not the, the way I wanted to be associated with. Mm. Um, it, it needs to be something that can be done by every single person I work with because I, I do not want somebody to walk away and say, okay, fine. No, that wasn't right. Um, it, it just, it just can't happen. It's not my, my work ethic. It's not my, it's not the way I, yeah, I work. Absolutely. So you touched on this machine that appears in January. <laughs> There's a problem with the culture of weight loss or good physical well-being. And appearance, especially appearance. It, it's about if you're, if you're slim, you're successful. And, yeah. Um, it's sad. The application of a fad. So it's like, right, I'll do this for two weeks so that I can get to a certain point, but then I'll just go back to however I was and then yeah. I'll come back to it another time. I think, and I'm sure you agree with me with this, well being and good nutrition is something that we need to kind of have part of us every day of our life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when we're, when we're looking at our body, such a complex masterpiece. And of course, we're all different, but we only have that one body. So to a certain extent, you can, you can replace parts of it, as we know, thanks to modern medicine. But generally, <laughs> you have this one body, and this will be with you until you die. And I think it's our responsibility. Because we're living in the Western world, we can afford to look after our body. And the fact that we have an abundance of food, an abundance of nutrients available doesn't necessarily mean that we are eating all the right food and um, do the right exercises to, to keep our body happy and healthy, sadly. So just with regards to the clients that you work with, what are the similar challenges that you have to face with new clients that you're working with when you're trying to get them to change their nutrition habits? Um, honestly, in, in many cases, it's, it's really not that difficult because by the time somebody comes to me, they know that they need to change something in order to achieve what they would like to achieve. Let me just give you an example. Um, I had, um, last year in August, um, a gentleman approached me, um, the CEO of a very successful company, um, and said he is experiencing every year in March a stomach ulcer as the onset of a very challenging quarter four because their major business is always happening in quarter four. Right. So he's, during those three, four months, um, he's He's hardly sleeping at all. He's working around the clock. Um, he's super stressed. Um, until up until last year, he was traveling all the time, different time zones, his body clock all over the place. Uh, never eaten anything right. If he's eating, then I don't know, close to midnight and literally no exercise, of course. And whatever problem there is, he faced it in quarter four. And his body, every every year in March, he has a new stomach ulcer and goes through that. Whoa. Um, and when I spoke to him, he said, okay, fine, I need to do something. And he was 47 at the point, I think. Um, and he said, okay, I'm, I'm approaching my 50th birthday and I want to be, at that point, the best form I've ever been. And could you make this happen? And I thought... Okay, there's a bit of work to do here. <laughs> but because he approached me in August, which was fantastic, because that's the quietest time in his business, we had three months, almost four, before the massive 
rush happened again. So I knew I had three or four months to work with him very intensively on a, on a weekly basis. Wow. So we went through all the details, everything he wanted to change and everything he needed to change. So as an example, um, he, he always liked running, which is a great start, but obviously he never took the time to run and he never, um, he never really had any routine in his running. And even better, he was always a morning person. And I thought, okay, fine, brilliant. Here we have our first to do on our list. We're getting up half an hour earlier every day and squeeze in a 45 minute run every morning. And he said, okay, fine, I can do this. And off he went. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that was absolutely no challenge. The food challenge for him was particularly tricky because of his, his extensive traveling all over the world, um, eating on planes, eating in airports, um, eating on the hoof all the time. That was a little bit more tricky because getting the right nutrients into somebody where, where he's, um, relying so much on, on, yeah, basically on restaurants or on catering of any sort. Um, but we, we got through this. So as in, just because all over the world, you get pretty much, um, sandwich platters, um, in, in all day meetings. Yeah. You know, that we're not going to do sandwich platters anymore. So, um, and I, and I share a little secret with you. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to say don't tell anybody, but okay, fine. Let's, let's go for this one. Okay. He, he is now telling everybody he's going to that he can't eat wheat and he doesn't tolerate gluten free products. And this is obviously a little bit of a white lie because it's not quite true. Yep. And then obviously the, the, sec the second question from the PA of his business contact would be, oh my God, what are we going to do for lunch for you? And he said, oh, don't worry too much. Just get me a salad um, with some um, sliced chicken or something. And that works perfectly for him. So rather than trying to educate everybody and especially the people, you, you don't want to upset your, your business contact, but if you tell them that you really have a, a medical issue of some sort. Um, if, nobody's asking that. If you tell them you don't like a sandwich, they're probably, oh, God, what's wrong with him? He doesn't <laughs> like a sandwich. Do we have to order something special? But he said he can't tolerate wheat and he's not happy with gluten. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So it's really interesting you highlight that. March this year, my wife and I, we started a new diet and we started a kind of different way of life. I've lost 10 kilos. Nice. I'm sleeping really well. I feel amazing. I'm jogging every morning now. So this oh, morning I, I ran <laughs> eight kilometers, which I've never been able to do before in my life. Fantastic. But whenever we're in social situations, because we have a new diet, just to give you a bit of context, all the diet is, is we just don't have any breakfast. And when we do eat, we eat at certain times. Ah, okay. Which has been really great for us. But mm -hmm. over the summer, we, you know, we went on a few holidays with some friends and all of them had breakfast and mm -hmm. we had to kind of figure out a way of mm -hmm. communicating with them that. That you're not having breakfast. Yeah, that, that we're still going to be in this social environment with you, but we're not going to eat. But don't let that change the positive environment that we're in at the moment. You know, don't focus mm -hmm. on it. Let's not even talk about it. We'll all still be together. We'll still have this moment, but we're just not going to eat. And initially, for my wife and I, we had to figure out how to deal with this in a way that didn't upset us. But also we had to work with our friends so that it didn't upset them as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm so glad we stuck to it because, you know, again, we still feel great and it's brilliant. There is a problem with society in how people live their lives, particularly in this country. And I do feel it needs to change, you know, because people are different and people do want to try things and do different things, but it shouldn't affect everyone. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, I think one of, one of the major issues is is how we are dealing with alcohol because it's it's socially so accepted mm. um and if with the exception of of a recovering alcoholic which is obviously um, a very serious illness 
But if if somebody says these days, going into a pub and ordering, I don't know, a Coke or a glass of water, um, the poor person, because you you still can't get any decent anti-alcoholic drinks, um, you, you're always being judged by other people. Um, yeah. And the... I don't know, the, the excuse that you are the driver, okay, fine, yes, that's an excuse. It's, it's at least one. Your friends will love you if you don't drink alcohol because you could be the driver all the time. <laughs> but it's, it, it's like you with your, with your wife and with that, with a not having breakfast. It's, it's your decision. And I think we should just accept that people make changes to their lives. And no matter what those changes are, that we should just accept them. Um, it, it's interesting that you're touching on the, um, we call it intermittent fasting. So when, you, because intermittent fasting is, can be, I have to say can be a really good way for some people to make those changes to their diet. But the, the one thing is, like with everything else, it doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. Um, especially for people with low blood pressure, for example, because they feel dizzy when they're not eating in a, on a regular basis. Um, but the, the other thing is that in terms of your social life, intermittent fasting can really put your social life on hold because nobody will understand that you're either not having breakfast like you have or Somebody just said, well, my eating window is between 12 and 6 every day. Um, okay, but what am I doing if I'm invited for dinner? So you can't accept any dinner invites. So and, um, I have, for example, I have one client. Um, she is, <laughs> she calls herself a hermit crab. <laughs> <laughs> she... Um, because she, she works online and, um, she has a funny working hours and a funny social life. And she says, I'm, I'm just trying intermittent fasting because I'm, I'm not going out for dinner anyway, because I'm working at that time. Um, she works a lot with, uh, with clients in the U S. So she can't really do anything, um, in the evening because the U S is just about to wake up and getting ready for the day when we're getting out, going out for dinner. Um, and sometimes it's just about making your own decisions, but you have to be strong enough to stand by it. Yeah. And, and lots of things are just, I don't know, cake parties when you try to lose weight and people telling you, oh my God, you look really gone. That doesn't help you because it's, it's your life and it's what you would like to achieve. But the, the pressure of our society to that only skinny people are healthy. Um, I think that is really sad because we all come in different shapes and sizes. And, yeah, um, absolutely. It doesn't have any, I, I work with a number of skinny people who are definitely not healthy, I'm afraid. Um, they, they may fit in size zero genes, but um, it, it's not really a healthy way of living. Absolutely. And for me, it's all about health. Um, but if I, if I can just add one more thing, because it might of be course. interesting for the, for the people who listen to this. Um, I work with, with clients pretty much all over the world. Um, because, and I, and I think this is, this is my, why I consider myself incredibly lucky that 2020 didn't have as much impact on my business as it had on others. Because I, I have always been working online with my clients. Um, I, I do um, consultations in the way I'm talking with you at the moment. I sit in front of my screen because the, the people I work with, they simply don't have the time to carve out an hour or one and a half hours of their day for a consultation to travel somewhere. Even if it is in London, I'm, I'll definitely uh, be at the wrong path, at the, at the wrong end of London, and they will be in exactly the other end of London. It will still take an hour to get to you. Yeah. Um, so I have, from the very beginning, I have always said to people, we can meet via Skype, over the phone, via Zoom, Teams, you name it. Um, it will be possible. Um, and, and that really helped my business this year to stay afloat. Um, it, it's a lot, it's a lot different for my colleagues who work one to one with people. The same for me as well. Since the beginning of March, just Zoom has been 
a great platform to engage with my clients. And it, it's allowed me to focus more on them as opposed to thinking about what train I have to get, or there might be a delay or just all of those things that can add a little bit of extra pressure on before this moment that you have with your client. So it's been great. I mean, I agree with you. Any business should be digital first, you know, if they want to be efficient. Yeah. Um, so it's really important. I'd like to kind of rewind a bit. You talked about how when you were going through this traumatic period in your life that you put on three stone. Mm-hmm. When you were given the realization that you needed to kind of change your ways, how long did it take you to get to a healthy space? Um, about, about nine, nine months, ten months. Wow. Um, I, I took my time. Um, the, the reason for that was because... That was all way before I was diagnosed. So I was, I was still trying to find my way around all the information I found and sort of played my way through it, if you like. Yeah. Um, it, it was not a, a strict, I know what I'm doing. There was still a lot of trial and error involved. Um, so even though I, I gained the weight really quickly, but to be fair, um, as an arthritis patient, a lot of weight gain is the swelling, the, the fluids which are located in your joints. Right. So it was, it was not only body fat due to the amount of sugar and ice cream and all the other lo- lovely things that have been eaten at that point. <laughs> um, it, it was um, fluids in my joints as well. Right. Um, and it 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 took step by step. So it it was not only that I changed my diet at that point where I thought, okay, fine, I know now. One of the things, for example, which really affected my arthritis um, was um, dairy. Funnily enough, because you you would think that dairy is really important for your bones, which it is. There's there's loads of. Um, um, Science findings that um, dairy and calcium and everything is brilliant for your bones, but it really had an effect on my joints. So I have a, in the meantime, a, a very mild intolerance to dairy. Um, I'm, I, I can get away with milk and yogurt. It's no problem. I just shouldn't overdo it. Yep. But at that point, whenever I had milk in my coffee, the next day I had a flare up. So I, I reduced my dairy intake. At, at that point, down to zero. And I knew, okay, fine, that means no more ice cream and uh, no more chocolate because there's quite a lot of dairy in chocolate. Mm. And all of those things were so, like, okay, fine, this is really tricky. So how do I manage that? And it was, it was a lot of trial and error. Um, yeah. So it took a, a relatively long time, but it didn't matter at that point because I knew I, I had a few things which helps me help me and i know that it will take time and it will be okay a lot of people don't realize how bad dairy can be the consumer machine particularly in this country has focused on the benefits of dairy and haven't really highlighted how too much of dairy can cause a lot of problems with your gut health in the future. And it's always that argument about calcium is where do you get your calcium from? And a lot of people don't know that you can get huge amounts of calcium from other ways that, that don't don't take into account dairy. Um, you, you, can, you can find loads of calcium in almonds, um, in green leafy vegetables. Yeah, spinach. Um, spinach is amazing. Yeah, exactly. Super really well done. Would you like to work for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because my wife and I have got some close friends that we hang a lot with mm-hmm. and we've had these conversations with them and it's just interesting just listening to their perspective on dairy. I remember going to school and we being forced to drink cartons of milk when we were a kid mm-hmm. and Obviously, when you were young, you need that amount of calcium in your... That's correct, yes. ...through that portal. But as you get old, there's no information about how much dairy you should have in your body. I'm not lactose intolerant, but I do know that dairy in moderation is fine. It's just when you have too much of it. Yeah. And and again, this is different for every person. Yes, of course. And of course, we, we have... We have to take things into consideration, which are a concern for many people like animal welfare. 
But if, if somebody comes to me and they say, I do not consume dairy because I'm not happy in the way we um, deal with cows in our in, in, in the UK or in the Western world, then I have to accept that. that but then it's my job to make sure that they get their calcium and their vitamins and nutrients and all of the things you can get in dairy somewhere else. And it's exactly the same like if you're if you're talking to a vegan, if you are talking to a, a meat eater, the, the gentleman I have I have been talking about earlier with his stomach ulcers, he was a massive lover of meat. And it's not my job to judge their taste or yeah. their preferences, not at all. If if somebody's telling me they are vegan or if somebody's telling me they are determined meat eaters, that's fine for me. Because I'm nutrition is inclusive. We it's not about demonizing or glorifying a food group. And I'm I'm very much looking at the low carb um and keto followers because it it can work for you, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's not the only way forward. And it's like that with every other diet under the sun. Absolutely. And I do like that word that you threw in there about inclusivity, because yeah. nutrition shouldn't be something that divides us. It needs to be something that we can all embrace in our own ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just looking at the the different parts of the world. I mean, yes, we we in the Western world, we are consuming dairy and our bodies are used to it. Um, in in Alaska, you won't find a lot of dairy. Well, sorry, that's that's not a particularly good um, example because they have supermarkets as well. Um, let's just say um, in the middle of Africa, you find you can't find a lot of dairy because refrigeration is a, is an issue. Right. Or the, the culture just doesn't allow for dairy. Those sorts of things, and it's it's all about what your body is used to and what is the cultural way of eating. And in J in Japan and in Asia, it's a completely different way of cooking, completely different foods. Everything is different, and mm. we're just it is what works for the sim for the for the individual person. Yes. So let's talk about well-being. You have initiated uh, lots of well-being retreats. Yes. Um, tell oh, us about them. Yeah. Oh, my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, your guest from last week, Dr. Vicky Barnes and I, we have met, um, I think, about a year ago or, or two years ago. And we realized instantly that we are literally tackling the topic of well-being and happy brains from different yet interrelated angles. And when when Vicky is talking about how the brain works and what we need to do to keep the brain happy, and I thought, oh, wow, this is exciting. And I start to talk about how your foods and you, the way you think affect your brain and keep it happy. We said, okay, fine, we have to do something together. So um, what we have started last year is we had um, a well-being retreat, which was obviously um, planned for May and didn't happen. And right. then it had been postponed to October. And we were just lucky to run it um, in between lockdowns. And we had such amazing feedback because we were able to really dig deep into what does well-being mean for the individual? Even though we obviously we had a larger group of people there, we we were able to make sure that everybody found their own well-being toolbox. We gave them a wide variety of ideas, which can be implemented immediately, starting obviously from great foods, um, but then how your body and mind experiencing foods and how do they experience new impacts in terms of being outside and finding out why we had we had lots of geese flying on top of our head and 
no, not on top of our head. What they call <laughs> over our head. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my English is losing me. No, um, no worries. <laughs> it's better than and, my German. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank God for that. <laughs> and we found out why why are geese um, chewing? There's all there's always some in the in in the back which is wah, wah, wah. and we, we found out why that is because they're telling the ones in the front that you need to go faster. And it it's really it was it was such an amazing experience, and all of that in. In, in an exclusive location where you can truly unwind and relax. It was, it was just brilliant. And Vicky, and I, I'm, I'm sure she said the same when she was um, on your podcast last week. It was, we had so much fun and we just decided we have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> where, where was your last retreat? Um, the last one was in the beautiful, um, at the beautiful south coast of Devon near Kingsbridge. Wow. Uh, where we, where we were close to the sea and we took, um, people, um, for, for beach walks and we spent, we did, uh, sunrise yoga and wow. meditations every day. Um, and we're, we're planning to have the next one in Cornwall where we have, um, a castle exclusively for us. Wow. So it's going to be absolutely fantastic. We, obviously, that limits the number of people we can take with us. Um, we have a limit of um, 18. Okay. We've got, we've got nine double rooms, so we, which we can have as a single occupancy, of course. But How are, long was the last hmm? retreat? Uh, three days. Three, three days. days. Okay. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, because we, we, we appreciate that people – don't necessarily want to get away from their life, their family, their business for for more than three days. Um, we, we wanted to do it for a week, but um, I think it, it would have been just too much to ask. Um, right. And the costs obviously would have would have then been um, a lot higher. But um, with with the three days, we think well, it's Wednesday to Friday, so we let people back to their to their life at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting. I mean, wellness has always been a hot proposition to so many people, but now more than ever, the niche of wellness has exploded and it's a, become a kind of pillar of travel and tourism. And there's oh, lots yeah. of people looking for those types of experiences. Absolutely. And I think we have the advantage um, that both our work is based on science. So we, we don't do, um, I call it woozy stuff, um, because we, we're both very straightforward people. Um, Vicky and I, we just love science and we love things we can explain. Yeah. Um, as, as much as those things you can't explain are always fascinating and I, and I love them, but I would not like to take a risk with my clients and the people who, who pay me some money to be at a retreat. I would like them to walk away with tried and tested strategies where they can pick and mix what works for them to make it a lasting impact. Not only for those three days when you just sit there and you have a fun, wonderful time and then you go home and then the stress just mounts back up on you again. That's not the point. <laughs> Again, it's always about giving guidance to guests. Yeah, I'd like to call them guests. <laughs> yeah, giving guidance to guests is so important. Yeah, Carola, I'm ever so sorry, but we're starting to come to the end of this chat. I yeah, feel like we're, really? I feel like we're only just touching on the great things that you do. So, I guess we're going to have to get you back on a future episode for sure. That would be lovely. Um, <laughs> call me; I'm here. <laughs> no, definitely. We've got like two more questions before we move to the end of the show. Sure. First one, through trauma, you've come on top and you've become this fantastic energy that's giving light to so many people now. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give yourself if you could go to the start of your professional career? Wow. Um, I, th I think it, it's, it's two-sided. I think on the one hand, the advice would be relax. It's all going to be okay. Yep. Because there were lots of moments where I 
I think, okay, fine, that was it. And um, I'm, I'm going to be in pain for the rest of my life and um, I'm, I'll never get out of this. Yeah. And I think th there's, there's always, there's always something and it, it's, it's going to be okay. Um, and the other one is clearly, and this is, that's the one which is a little bit of my, of my mantra is never give up. Okay. Um, it, it, it comes into the, into the same picture because sometimes I work with people on a, on a long term basis when there is something serious, maybe a health condition. Um, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes there is. And that obviously takes longer than helping somebody to calm down in stressful situations and eating the right foods and getting their nutrients right. Um, and when that's, when that's the case, and they are, they are ever so often a moment where you think, ah, oh, God, no, come on, leave me alone. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Because no, we're not giving up. We're going to get this done and we're going to get it sorted. And once it's then we get to that point, then I say, come on, it was worth it. Uh, not to give up. So, Corolla, thank you so much for this. This has been amazing. You're very welcome. There's going to be lots of people listening to this who want to get in contact with you. What's the best way for them to do that? I think by far the best way to contact me would to email me directly. Yeah. Um, so it's Carola, C A R O L A, yeah. at carolabecker.com. Uh, C A R O L A B E C K E R dot com. Um, if you would like to, um, my my favorite um, is LinkedIn. Okay. Um, and then my my LinkedIn name is Carola Becker, nutrition coach, lifestyle coach with items in between. Cool. All right. Well, look. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Those of you listening, thanks so much for your time. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you're safe. If you get a chance, please do subscribe, please share, and don't forget the hashtag Tiger Heart Chats, all one word. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, please be good.